Welcome to the Techonomy webcast from Davos. I'm David Kirkpatrick, the chief techonomist of Techonomy, as I like to call myself. And uh, we're here with Dr. David Agus, somebody who's been at Techonomy's conferences, who's one of the world's leading thinkers about the future of healthcare, a Davos veteran. And I just wanted to start, David, by asking you, you know, having been part of the dialogue about progress in health and society for a long time, what are, you, what are you feeling here at this year's Davos that's different, and, and is it proving to be productive for you? For me, it's always productive. And, you know, I always kind of say, oh, I have to go because, it's, as you know, it's very taxing physically. Yeah. Um, but who you can meet in this five-day span is just staggering from my perspective. CEO of all the biotechnology and pharma companies, the health ministers, the thinking across all the global area. Because in my field, we get very focused on the U.S. And when you see what's going outside, it changes. You know, it's been a wild year with Zika the year before with Ebola. So a lot's happening on a global basis that we have to think about and coordinate. And there's so many stakeholders in it. Only a place like this can bring them all together. Well, tell me how you would assess our progress towards really, you know, Techonomy is really a believer in tech-based transformation. And we see healthcare as probably the single industry where the pieces are in place, but they're not really fully being taken advantage of. Do you see a possible breakthrough there? I certainly hope so. I mean, so we're reliant. I think the future is going to be the technology. And we're starting to see some breakthroughs. You know, this is really an amazing time, mainly because of computing power. So big data is real. The ability to uh, apply machine learning or AI algorithms to the big data are real. And that's starting to happen now. You know, what will make it explode is when we stick to data standards. And that, again, is starting to happen. So I think we're at the beginning of that revolution. You know, I went to CES in January. And I was shocked, you know, an entire warehouse of wearable devices. Right. And, you know, wearable devices have been around for many years, as you and I have talked about before, but the engagement has been short, right? You wear it for a month, you get tired, you get the next device. Engagement has been the issue. But now that we're going to start to put context to data, I think there's going to be a big change. When you talk about standards, talk a little more about what you mean there and, and how big of a challenge is it and how, how likely are we able to resolve it? So if, if you have a big database, and let's say I get 10 hospitals to throw in their data, you know, if they were all using the same terminology, it'd be pretty easy to search and look for associations, to learn more, to really understand things. The problem is we all have a different vocabulary we use. So imagine if you and I each wrote a book and we made up every word, and I gave each other his book. I have no idea what you're talking about and vice versa. Well, that's what the health field is. If you come in me and your knee hurts, I make up the adjectives and I put them there. Yeah. There's no standards. When I say he has a bad cut, who knows what the word bad means? But could we get standards? And if we did, who would be the one to help organize that and make it happen? There are about the six standards that exist. So, yeah. you know, there's always, the, 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 the jokesters always say, we have standards. The problem is we have too many standards. Right. And so, classically, it's Department of Commerce, the division called NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology, of which there's a subdivision that deals with health. So the private sector proposes it, and they stamp it, and we have standards. Okay, but now you're talking about standards at the level of hospital sharing and doctors, groups, etc. Doesn't the same problem exist for wearables? So, you know, we have the... The Apple standard based, we have the Fitbit stuff, we have all kinds of every watch company under the sun. I assume they're not all delivering data in the same formats. No, and so I think what we need is an agreement of all of them to start to have some harmonization schema for their data. So the way you count what a step is and the way I do is the same, we can start to correlate that, and there's going to be a new rise of these companies that basically aggregate that health data and put it into context. Mm, okay. Because those are data generation devices. Yeah. Actually putting it into context and meaning, nobody's done that well yet. Okay, I just go back to what you said before about NIST, which is a federal agency. Um, do you have the kind of confidence that we would want to have that the federal government is going to retain its role as a guiding force in these kinds of critical issues of progress as things are so stirred up? And we don't hear any talk about technology as a social driver in Washington right now. So it, it worries me a little bit that we may be stepping back there. So there's X bandwidth for health in Washington. And for the last decade, that bandwidth is consumed by healthcare finance. Right. That's all anybody talks They're about. They're still obsessed with it. I love Affordable Care Act. Let's knock the knees off the Affordable Care Act. You both directions. Right. What we need to change the discourse to are things that matter. Good. And my hope is, is that now we'll do that with a new administration. Do I know that? 
No, but I think, you know, hopefully they're going to bring on some smart people in this area and there'll be enough bandwidth that we can make a difference. So you really think that's possible? That's, that's encouraging. Now, at our Tech Economy Conference, Tech Economy New York Conference last uh, May, you were unbelievably optimistic about how AI could really play a role in healthcare and really make us healthier in a fu fundamental way over time. Talk a little bit about what you think is possible when we, you know, assuming we can work out these standards issues. I know you believe some amazing things are going to be possible, and it always is gratifying to hear you say it because otherwise it's easy to get depressed about some of this stuff. I'm going to take a prop here to make it a little bit easier. Please. So say you're a pathologist now. You look under a microscope to see if something's cancer. This is normal and this is cancer. It's pattern recognition, right? right? And you get a binary function, yes, no. But the arrangements of the cells, where they are, what they do is yielding so much more information. So now AI can start to look at those and to say, not just this, this is cancer, but this is a cancer with this kind of behavior or will respond to this drug or won't respond to a drug. So we're gonna get a lot deeper on the information that's already there. And I think that's starting to happen. Same thing with when you get a chest x-ray. You know, there's a mass there. Well, it's lung cancer or it's pneumonia. Well, the shape of it, you know, when the climate model looks at the shape of the cloud, it tells them the weather. It tells them the wind speed. It tells them everything going on. Well, the shape of that lesion in the lung tells us a lot more. We've never been able to pull that information out. You know, so these x-rays are talking to us. We just never listened. Hmm. And the power of computing, the power of uh, machine learning, AI, is that we can start to learn from each event. You know, when you go to a patient, if you come to me and you have a disease, and I say, I'd love to use your data in an anonymized way where I take off all identifiers, but I want you to be part of the cure, hope goes up. You know, you don't want to suffer for no reason, but when you're suffering, it can help others, maybe your children, maybe your grandchildren, maybe yourself, there's some real positivity to that. You mean because you're willing to share your data yeah. with research, etc., therefore it's going to help mankind. And at the, t the time scale that we're talking about now, observations literally several weeks later can change how we clinically practice. Yeah, but I know you also are really a believer that we're going to succeed at personalizing medicine. So talk about how we're going to do that and how opti I mean, I hope you're as optimistic as you were last May still on that because you cheered me up when I heard you talking about it. How, how soon and how, how well we'll be able to personalize medicine? So we've been unidimensional in terms of personalization of medicine over the last decade. It's DNA, right? DNA is everything. We sequence you. Gentlemen, I'm as guilty as anybody else. I'm not putting the finger at anybody. But now we can look at so many more aspects. Think about it this way. If you're going to drive from New York to Boston and you take apart a car and look at every piece, it doesn't tell you how long it takes to get there. You forgot the weather, the traffic, the bladder size of the driver, how much caffeine the driver drank. They all matter. And the beauty is this new era of personalization, yeah. you know, especially with AI and machine learning behind it, is going to bring all those aspects in. Yeah. So we can start to learn about the system. You know, an amazing study came out last year where they looked at the eyelid. It's the only place on the body that you classically don't put sunscreen on. And in 100 straight people, they found... Because it gets in your eye if you put it on there. You're quick. Well, anyway. Every DNA cha change of cancer was there, yet none of the people had cancer. Because you need a DNA change and you need a receptive environment. So when we talk about personalization, it's going to be about your environment. It's going to be about the disease cell itself and the intersection between those two. So that's a whole new level of personalization we're getting to. And it's going to be very exciting. And there are new technologies coming along. Proteomics, right? That drop of blood has all the proteins in your body. And that's the conversation in your body. Your body's always been talking. And for the first time now through technology, we can listen in. Then you couple that with the microbiome. No offense, David, but you have tenfold more bacteria in you than human cells in you. <laughs> These bacteria, they it control your matter. metabolism, what you absorb, many aspects of your body. That's another level of personalization. And you couple that with DNA, which we're already doing pretty well. All of a sudden, it's multidimensional. I, I cut you off on your eyelid example. Ex explain to me what you were... I, I get very excited about sunscreen because I'm such a believer in it, but... What was, your, what was your point? I didn't quite understand so that, it. Your religion is sunscreen is what you're saying? It's one of the few that I people have. People who yeah. wear sunscreen have slightly more cancers than people who don't. Really? Yes, because they're actually in the sun much longer, and while it does protect against burns, there is more DNA damage. Oh, they get it on the one place they don't cover, which is their eyelid. But so the eyelid is the place you don't put sunscreen on. So yeah. what they did was they sequenced the DNA of eyelids. Uh -huh. You know, people had eyelid surgery, so plastic surgery. I try surgery. to stay out of the sun, too, by the way, but go on. Yeah, yeah but I'm looking at your eyelids now. There's some issues there. <laughs> I bet there is. And so, so we sequence that DNA, and what you find is that all the DNA changes that we classically associate with cancer were in the cells of the eyelid, yet there was no cancer. 
Because in order to get cancer, you need to change your DNA, but you need a re uh, an environment that's receptive. If you drop a match after it rains, nothing happened. You drop a match in Los Angeles where it's a drought, it goes up in flames. So the environment matters. Yet we've never categorized the environment to medicine. Oh, wow. So to me, diseases are verbs and not nouns. You're cancering, you're heart diseasing. So it's to change you from a disease state to a health state. And that's a radically different way of thinking about health and disease and about personalization of things. So really what you're saying is the way we're moving as we get more data is just a much more holistic picture of the yeah. individual and their specific issues that really aren't quite so generalizable as to say he has heart disease or he has you know skin cancer or it's a classic kind of groups that we've put people into. No, but it's the holistic view. I mean, you, you, your watch, it knows how much you move during the day. Well, movement over time equals health. There's dramatic data that movement over time, not just at the gym, can lower risk of heart disease and cancer, but that's not in your electronic medical record. So mm. one of the biggest risk factors being sedentary isn't even in there. So pretty soon, that data will go seamlessly from the Internet of Things into your electronic medical record. Huh. And we're going to learn a lot more about you. And then the context of that data. When you're driving, you know, that, that self-driving car, even though you're driving, there are cameras there. So it knows your reaction time to a pothole. Right. So it knows a lot about what's going on in your brain in a moment in time. One day you're reacting early, the next day late. Well, you probably didn't get enough sleep. And so it could start to put those correlations together. And you're going to start to say, listen, if I sleep this much, I react better. And that translates to performing better at work, to being more fun with your kids. We're going to start to learn about things. And that's the power of combining Internet of Things, personalized medicine and behavior together. So you're saying our health technology of the future is going to be almost an advisory service in a sense. Yeah, it's going to be putting data into context. Yeah. I want to ask you about something you've kind of hinted at, but I got very curious about recently interviewing Craig Venter on stage at a conference in San Francisco just a week and a half ago. You know, because he's got this hum Human Longevity Institute where he's, you know, basically poking and probing someone as thoroughly as he can and also taking their DNA and then trying to come up with correlations in a word you've used, which I didn't realize until I was talking to him and thinking about it that we have obsessed sort of over the DNA information, which you were saying earlier but we don't really know what it means and I thought it was interesting that he's trying to sort of work backwards now from the other side to correlate it to what's actually happening in individuals is that an important approach in your opinion yeah but it needs to be done because there are three billion letters in the DNA code you can't do that with a hundred people or a thousand you need right. hundreds of thousands and how will we get there so I mean there are programs ongoing now the NIH has a very large hundred thousand person program there's a program in the UK to try to do this so those programs are ongoing but there's a lag time one of the biggest problems in medicine let's say I put you on a drug to prevent heart disease I'm not gonna know if it works for 15 years so there's a lag time Damn. so how do I get you David to change a behavior when I don't have a metric to tell you it's working, right? And so that lag time has been one of the biggest problems we have in medicine. So the answer is what we call surrogate markers, biomarkers, changes in stress hormones and other things. And what you're gonna see is the next generation of smartwatches through the skin are gonna be able to measure some of those things in blood. Mm. So without poking and prodding, we could dynamically show how things change. And then we can correlate that to later outcome. So when you have a parameter upon which to optimize, you actually change behavior. Hmm. And so the beauty is the next generation of watches will be able to do that. One of the big problems is that a third of men have too much hair on their arm for these watches to work. So the probes are going to have to be in the back side of the watch. So that okay. means a power supply from here to here. So the little technical hurdles which will be overcome. What a funny problem. Okay. But it's going to be a problem. Hairy men is one of the biggest issues we have in society today. I wish I had that problem. But anyway, <laughs> uh, well, maybe I don't. I don't know. Uh, do you want to talk more about it? <laughs> Are you a shrink too? <laughs> uh, anyway, so let's, we're about to run out of time here. Yes. But I'd like to kind of just ask that classic question of what's the most exciting or interesting thing you've experienced or learned here at Davos? For me, it's two. One is in the health domain and one is not. As you know, I was privileged to sit the first day and hear uh, you know, President Xi from China speak. And to hear the eloquence of his talk, how he started his talk with a quote from Dickens, know. the best of time, the worst of time, really show that this may be a turning point in terms of you know, the role of China you know, in, in the world. And you know, from my side, it's the global governance side on health. And you know, recently, there's an amazing story in New York. A woman couldn't get pregnant because she had what we call a mitochondrial disorder. And remember, there are chromosomes with your DNA, and then there's some the DNA in the mitochondria. And she had a defective mitochondria. And so her doctor took her to Mexico, 
took out her chromosomes and put them into another woman's egg and replaced her chromosomes with the woman from New York City and then took the sperm from the father and the woman got pregnant. Mm. So in a sense, the child had three parents, the donor egg, the right. mother, and the father, and then she flew back to New York City. The doctor wasn't sure this was legal in the United States, so she flew to Mexico. And it just underscores the point that we need global governance for health. We now have the ability with CRISPR to change one letter of the three billion letters of DNA code. So we can do a lot, but we need to figure out a way to make sure it's done right, yep. ethically, legally, and appropriately so we can all benefit. Yeah, there's so many issues for which we need a more global approach and we need governments to pay more attention to the things that technology is now making possible. Great to have you, Dr. David Agus. Read his great books. The guy is one of the great thinkers about tech and health and uh, even global relations. I agree with you about President Xi. So thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, David.